Hola. Bonjour. Ni hao. Moi. Privet. Guten tag. A, however you say it. Everybody, welcome to the Normal Not Normal podcast with myself, James Phelps. And me, Oliver Phelps. And James, can you believe that we have made it all the way to this, our last episode of this season? I know, it's it's crazy. It's gone very quick. But I'm so glad that we've had such a great time. And I'm so glad that everybody else has had such a great time as well. Obviously, we can't do this without everybody listening and sharing their thoughts and everything else about it. So, guys, thank you very much. We really do hope you've enjoyed the season. And today, I think you're going to enjoy this episode as well. We do indeed. But before we get on to our chat with Bonnie, um, yeah, I was just thinking about like the great fun we've had on this season so far, not just obviously with the listener participation episodes as well, which has been an absolutely brilliant thing to be able to do this year. I've had so much fun. Um, as we as we spoke about last week, obviously, uh, listening to all your your input and questions and story times and stuff, and the did you knows, it's all been really really great fun. So you know, thanks again for your your input into it, and also a best special thanks as well to the other guys who joined us on this podcast this season. So I'm talking about obviously Jacqueline Wilson, Jenny Tamine, Sophie Skelton, April Pearson, DJ Tiger, Billy and Dom, and obviously this week's Bonnie. Um, They've just been some amazing times, like actually listening and talking to people and hearing what it is they had to say um, in terms of talking with us and stuff like that has been has been really special. Definitely, I think what what's always great about speaking to people is that, and we we speak to people that we we either know or know of, so it's not like we've just been given a thing and you go speak to this person like we we, we generally mm. enjoy speaking to these people and then i remember the, for the, the first episode of of this season was obviously jackie wilson and yeah speaking to jacqueline was amazing for, I'm, I'm a i was a huge fan growing up as hers and i still by the way that railway book that she was on about the rail uh, rewriting of the railway oh yeah is epic like check it out it was awesome so it was great her speaking taking the time to speak to us about that and that was cool and then it was also fun um i also really enjoyed because we recently just filmed actually with sophie um sophie skelton after like we we filmed a project together and then she came on on the podcast so that was cool as well hearing getting her because she is one of those people that can do absolutely anything isn't she so it was it's always funny when that kind of thing comes out and it's really annoying when they're really nice people as well I don't know, <laughs> it helps us it helps us when they're really nice people but it's, it's been it has just been great listening to different people and, and reminiscing about either things we've worked together on or or things we know about and just to dig a little deeper into that so it has been it has been really really super so guys thank you so much and if you've missed any of the previous episodes then they are just go back through the archives and they are all there but talking about archive stuff this being the last episode and Obviously, we've we've built up, you know, you know what to expect. We're talking about what is people's normal, um, which we didn't get to do with Bonnie the first time around. We had her on the podcast because we hadn't actually come up with the concept of things being normal, not normal. Merch plug there. Um, so it's more a case of we just wanted to chat to Bonnie about it and also see what else she's got going on as well at the moment. So, James, would you like to set this one up? Sure. Well, everybody, as you probably know, Bonnie Wright played Ginny Weasley in the Harry Potter films, uh, our, our little sister, and we've known Bon for a long, long time. So last year we were able to hang out a little more with her because she came on, she came and joined us on a travel show that Oliver and I have been filming. We also hung out at the Harry Potter reunion and basically just just hung out i mean we we were very lucky to be able to be good friends anyway but she's always up for a great chat and today i'm really excited because bonnie has also written a book she has done indeed so anyway look guys without any further ado ladies and gentlemen miss bonnie wright <laughs> bonnie how are you thank you very much for joining us thank you i'm very well how are you both very yeah, good doing- thank you Doing really, really glad. Bon, we're so happy that you were able to come back um, for a chat with us on the, on this uh, on our podcast. It's slightly changed since we were we were last doing it, but it's fair to say the last time you were on went pretty viral. Um, so it's yeah, great to be able to have you back. So yeah, so it was, it was really, really good to be able to see you. But uh, yeah, how's how's tricks anyway today? 
things are good. Things are doing well. I feel like, yeah, when we last spoke, I feel like maybe it was at the beginning of COVID. I can't remember um, when it was, but maybe it was then. It felt like probably two years ago. Obviously, we've seen each other since then. Um, but things are good. Just um, living life. Excited to chat. Um, talk about things I've been up to. Um, and yeah. So the the new concept for this form, uh, this podcast spawn is trying to figure out what normal is and if normal actually is a real thing, if it even exists. Uh, so mm-hmm. we know that you are very much into the climate movement and you've been like that for many years, uh, spreading the word about Hummel effects, about using single plastics, with, and you work with Greenpeace, uh, sustain and talking about sustainable, sustain, talking about sustainable issues. <laughs> Sustainable? Today. Sustainable issues? Sustainable. Sustainable. <laughs> sustainable. Yeah, self-sustainable <laughs> issues. So all these are very simple acts that you do. But for example, like the reusable items using it as a daily thing, do you think it's easy for that to become a normal thing? Yeah, I think so. I think we're like, while we're creatures of habit and we can get like ingrained in one and we think it's impossible to shift habits, I think actually we're a bit more like adaptable and changeable than we think. I always think it just takes like that first couple of weeks or month to sort of like implement maybe a new habit in your life or just remembering to bring your, you know, reusable containers to skip out on sort of single use plastics and packaging. So I think once you begin to pack those in your bag, have them in your car, like have them on your desk at work, then I think they begin to be as normal as grabbing your keys and your phone when you, you know, get out the door. So I think you can be surprised, and I have been surprised at how suddenly normal those practices become in your life because you implement them, you sort of feel like just in your own small way, a sense of kind of achievement and kind of you're becoming part of the change you want to see even if it's sort of seemingly insignificantly small I think just you're like okay well I've tried and I want to try I'm not going to kind of let life pass me by and these big issues pass me by without having a go so I think the minute you start finding some joy and sense of achievement out of those new habits they then become more normal and ingrained because like you get a good sense of feeling out of them Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's pretty easy for anyone to see like your passion for it, and even more so since you started your YouTube channel. Go gently. Mm-hmm. Uh, side note yes. to everyone watching, go and check it out. Uh, but while yeah. I was watching your clear out episode, they basically go through yeah. your closet, sorting out your clothes and saying, you know, stuff I don't need anymore. I was watching it and I was saying, oh, that's a really good idea, isn't it? And, and Mrs. P was sat next to me and she's like, I've literally been on at you for ages to do something like that <laughs> oh so you'll listen to bonnie will you listen to bonnie but not me when i can say that but uh, but the great thing um i took away from watching it anyway was how you didn't just say right don't just bag it up and either just mm-hmm. leave it at like a charity shop doorstep or look bit chuck it in a bin to go into landfill mm-hmm. but actually have other ideas like be it asking your mates like if they want any of it if you can actually even just repair anything as well mm-hmm. um and not just binning it to stop like that fast fashion type of thing um where did that idea come from to get the the website going to be able to actually, um, yeah, I suppose just put out more of your message and more ideas to people? Yeah, I guess so. I'd been writing my book and, and really enjoyed the process of like working on a book and working in text that was outside like video and, and, and everything and, and sort of a bit outside of like social media. The book felt like a really like more old school way of kind of communicating my ideas. But then when I was writing it, I was like, there's just, I can't fit everything in this book. And there are some things that could be a bit more fun and conversational to sort of like communicate through film. And I think I had missed sort of making films through the process of writing because it was just like, yeah, a year and a half, two years of writing. And I missed my love of like making little film projects. And it had been a long time, to be honest, since I'd been like in front of the camera. So it was kind of a fun challenge to get back in front of the camera with the YouTube videos. And I just felt that they were a bit more kind of diary-like and kind of showed that hopefully these things can be sort of obtainable and sort of approachable. And that was really the kind of tone that I wanted to go for, just that like, yeah, approachable, obtainable, kind of fun, and just giving ideas. I really didn't want to, and the whole book, like I don't want to, 
I definitely am not an expert. I'm not trying to tell people this is right or wrong. It's just like, these are different things we can explore, but like, it's really up to the individual to work out like what they think works for their life. So yeah, with the YouTube, it's just been really fun to start it and really just get loads of people's like comments too in the YouTube videos of different people trying different things or sharing what they found. Um, I feel like the more information we have together, the better like our better informed we are. And then, yeah, the website also um, for Go Gently's website, that mainly was kind of a space to bring on some different like guest writers, the opportunity to write some articles on there too, in and around same themes, but have really had like, I have about like two different guest writers a month write like an article piece and was interested in stuff again, existing a bit off social media and allowing it to be just a bit longer like this conversation you know it could be a nice long conversation and the website was this idea that you know people could write a nice long piece of writing that wasn't just in a caption on instagram mm. like, or a tweet kind of thing like an old-fashioned blog yeah like an old-fashioned an old-fashioned blog yeah <laughs> it's an old-fashioned well, blog we're that old now um, yeah. but you need a blog. I, I remember you <laughs> exactly but I remember you so talking about the book I remember you telling us ages ago that you were you were writing it and here we yeah. are now with the Im imminent release of Go Gently uh, tell us yeah. about it when it comes out where can we get a copy and how fun was it for you to put all your th thoughts about stuff down on page yeah yeah so it comes out on the 19th of April so like less nearly less than two months away and uh, yeah I'm kind of like excited and scared at the same time to have a book like out you feel quite like I've poured everything I have into this book I've loved writing it so much and really it's just you know it's obviously full of information um, it's really full it's very practical it's very kind of like things that you can apply to your day-to-day -day life kind of projects recipes kind of guides kind of handbook idea so I hope that people can read it cover to cover but also it's a kind of book that you could just dip in and out of uh, as well like a cookbook is um and yeah i'm excited as i say like a bit nervous it's always like when you put your everything into something there's always that like first like fear of like you suddenly quite feel quite vulnerable but um i'm excited for it to come out and i just recorded the audiobook the other day that was really fun to do um reading your own words, you kind of, I was worried that I was going to start like hating it as I was reading it out loud, um, but it wasn't too bad. And um, yes, yeah, so it comes out in April um, and yeah, I'm excited. I mean, I haven't even seen a physical copy myself. In fact, I think today is the like official like binding, di like the day it's bound or whatever at the printers. Uh, shouldn't so, you be there for that? I was going to say, shouldn't it be a ceremony? I know, I that? don't know what, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you she, get the first one off like, the, you can fresh off the press. Yeah, so I'll get like a box of like the first uh, round in like a couple of weeks, I think, in like two weeks. So I'm very excited to mm, see and was, it, was, hold it in the flesh. And was was going into publishing something you always wanted to do, or is it just kind of a byproduct of you know what people ask me this type of thing? Mm -hmm. As you as you said, get to more a more old school style of thing, which isn't on in a video format, which isn't on a a blog or a website type thing yeah you know I never ever thought I'd write a book it's definitely been like a nice thing that's like surprised me I think what happened is like everything was just a slow accumulation of ideas and interests through the work that I've done with Greenpeace and other organizations and just my own curiosity in the actions I've been taking around the climate crisis so it was yeah an accumulation of ideas and it kind of first began as kind of like a, almost not a book I wanted to make, but just almost like a little kind of zine magazine, just like a small pamphlet type thing that I wanted to just do for myself. And I was interested in like taking photos and making it a nice visual piece. And then suddenly the idea sort of developed and formed at the end of like 2019 was when I really like thought of the kind of name of the book and how the chapters are broken up. And then yeah and then I literally like in terms of how it like came to be and how I like went and got a publisher I obviously first was like I guess you have to find a book agent so I met some people's who connect like friends connected me to different book agents but then I kept just I was like I'm just gonna look up all the books that I like and see if like who's the agent to these 
people's books. And so this one woman's name kept like popping up as their agent. So I just like blind emailed her and I was like, hey, I have this like concept for a book. Will you be my book agent kind of thing? And then she became my book agent. So that was cool to like just go for it and email someone blindly. Um, it was that easy. The- yeah, it was that. Obviously, my idea is that good, so it's fine. <laughs> but the and the publishing that process was quite interesting. You had to write like, you know, you have you do like a book proposal, which was like 30, 40 pages long, and then I pitched it to like eight different publishing companies, um, all over like Zoom. It was quite an interesting uh, like experience. Just that itself, like kind of presenting your idea and you know being challenged mm. by like their ideas and similar I guess how people would go in and like pitch a film to a production company or finance company um so yeah and then I wrote it I started kind of writing it in January last year so it was quite a quick turnaround of writing and finishing and there's also a lot of photographs and illustrations in it too so it's not just me talking there's nice imagery in it too (laughs) When you were doing the audio bit, was that the first time? I, I'm, I can only relate to whenever I, uh, when I was at school and you'd write a story, I never read it through mm-hmm. all the way. But when you did the audio, I, I'm assuming that when you wrote it, you didn't go from start to finish in one go. So when you well, did, did the audio quite, record. Yeah, I did a well, few no, times like in the last. Yeah, I it was painful to read from cover to cover. But like when I was in the final stages of like editing it, like. I had to, even though I really was of that thought. It was like, I can't finish it. I can't read it again, having written it and read it each chapter, like in itself loads of times. But I was like, I have to read it cover to cover. So I did do that like a couple of times through different editing processes. And it was really quite hard because I was like, this is long. Mm. <laughs> but So when I read it in the audio book, that wasn't the first time I read it all the way through. Okay, right. But I hadn't looked at it because I'd like finished it for like four months or something. So it was kind of yeah. interesting, like going back to it. I was like, oh, yeah, I forgot I wrote this part. That's um, a really good bit of text. That. That's a really yeah. Good, yeah, yeah. Just like pack myself on the back every couple of, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I was, I was glad to hear that the Lopacia, was that how we pronounce it? The jumpers Lopa that we got Pesa. when we were in. Lopapesa. Lopapesa. Yeah. Uh, the jumps that we got when we were in Iceland didn't get cleared out of your wardrobe as well. Um, I know, for, yeah, they're in my in my wardrobe. And for the those, hat I bought matching. For those listening or watching, I'm wondering what on earth are we on about. So Bonnie was with Oliver and myself, and we went on a trip to Iceland uh, to film an episode of our up and coming travel show. And without going into too much details of what we did, we want to keep some things. Of just for the show but we we're able to get these amazing icelandic jumpers we were it's more exciting I, I than mine. that <laughs> yeah what you see will what we're doing while wearing them is even while more wearing exciting. the warmest jumper of all time yeah, yeah I'm, I'm really glad that you didn't do the full pitch for make getting the show made james on that on the back of that one there <laughs> what, we're gonna go to, we're gonna go to iceland and buy some jumpers yeah 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 it's um, gonna be great you're gonna love it it's a whole hour <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I remember when, when we when we were out there. Actually, we were driving. Do you when we were driving into Husavik? So we've been doing a a day's filming. We were driving into this little town called Husavik, which is on like the north part of Iceland. And um, I remember as we were going in, we put the song Husavik on, which is from the Eurovision movie starring Will Ferrell and Rachel McAdams. Have you watched the film yet? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't want to lie. Oh um, no! I know. <laughs> So many, so many lost jokes in in this one with Bonnie. Oh, like we were saying like, oh yeah, yeah this we was. Went to, there was like that little museum. That place was hilarious. Oh, we ended up in the Yaya Ding Dong bar. Yeah. Which was epic. So if you're ever in Iceland, go to the Yaya Ding Dong bar. The people who run it are very nice. <laughs> and uh, there's elves outside. Really are. Yeah. <laughs> but did that, but in ter- but just going back to the loft places there though, Bond. Is that is that type of thing? You know, when we're talk- you were talking, you're talking on the on your uh, on your one video about like fast fashion and the dangers of that and how it is mm-hmm. you know all about not about sustainability but about getting wear it for a season bin it by the next best yeah. thing for whereas like say with the loft places which is something that hasn't changed for i don't know how long centuries i want to say centuries, probably, probably yeah. like how they've made it and everything like that and i remember when we got it even the lady was saying 
yeah, this will last you about 15 years. And, mm -hmm. you know, you, is that the type of fashion that obviously we should be looking at more, more achievable? What yeah, definitely. And for? like, yeah. And I think what was even like even greater example of that Lopper Pacer, you know, it was where we bought them was like a knit, knitting association. So it's a network of people who knit for that company. So obviously that's like keeping individual like craft artisan makers, like a, it gives them a job and they can be part of a kind of network of makers and not have to just get into commerce. They could just make their thing and the, and the shop sell them. And I think I remember her mentioning, you can like post it back to them and they'll like mend it and send it back. So that's also a huge thing. Like not only obviously why those things are good is because they're made from really lasting, like durable sort of self cleaning type uh, fabric, the wool. Um, and also like the, is the chance to mend it whereas so many things you know once they're just a tiny bit broken or a button's missing or something we just assume like we're done with it and that's waste um rather than first thinking to like oh maybe i can mend it or i don't like this anymore maybe i could restyle it or refashion it or hmm. different things like that so i would say yeah i think we need to be thinking like quality over the quantity of stuff we have and just having good pieces that last a long time that like also stay looking nice i think a lot of stuff some fabrics like quickly rub up and don't look that good but some fabric really like holds its kind of form and looks still nice and i think it's yeah i think it's a case of like our responsibility to the clothing we have to like be more caring of it and mend it um and also then just like support companies that are actually like have like good morals and they care about like their impact and when you, <clears throat> when you were in Iceland and we were able to gate crash quite a few things that you were up to, um, did, was, it, was that the first time you'd been able to travel properly in like a couple of years? Yeah, the only thing I'd done was just go home to London, but I hadn't actually like traveled in a, lot, in, a, in a while. So to go to Iceland, yeah, after not traveling, you're like, wow, like the world is incredible um, and so alive. I feel like Iceland is so inspiring. It's so like just like happening after everything feeling quite like still and dormant during like lockdowns and everything just being quite repetitive to go there and be like there's a volcano there's like all these things erupting and moving and like the things nothing's like still so that was a nice reminder i think also often just to see like wonder in nature when obviously a lot of the work I've been doing with the writing can get like quite overwhelming and depressing sometimes when you think about like what's really happening within our climate. So I felt like going there and just being reminded by like the beauty of nature and people's kind of sort of perspective and outlook there on their environment is like so loving and like proud. So it was nice to, I think, like meet Definitely. people there too. Yeah, and that was as, as you say, like there was just this, this warmness and just a, a pride of where they are. And you know, did you see this? Did you see that? Even to a point where I remember mean, we had to park up somewhere, mm -hmm. and we got out the car, and I can't explain how many flies oh, were yeah. around. Yeah, like people that place. literally went nets yeah. on their faces to stop it. But it was just like, yeah, it's how it is here. Yeah, and there was no one trying to go around with like bug spray and everything like yeah. that. It was like yeah, Look, you're here as much as they are. Yeah, like they like deal with it. They have to deal with us. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it was, it was nice seeing that side of things. But uh, yeah, no, it, was, it was awesome. It was awesome. What would say? What would you say would be without getting into specifics, if you can? What would you say was your most outstanding your thing? What you you took away from that that trip? Yeah, I mean, again, just the idea of like everything was just so like alive and raw. Just felt like gave me, yeah, just made me like just made me kind of hopeful and like that things are possible like that a volcano could like erupt and it's actually built from that i don't know it just felt very like uh raw and alive whereas i think often we think we're very like stuck and everything's just how it is i mean i think obviously things are quite stuck in urban environments because they're made from more specific materials that don't move unless they're not mm. down mm. um so yeah it just it just reinvigorated me it felt quite like alive and i just loved all the sort of just the natural like storytelling like personalities that were there in Iceland like everything was a story it wasn't just like as it was it like had like layers to it so that was nice just a reminder of like the importance of story and how like way more interesting it is when someone tells you something in this beautiful story and 
and their belief in you know their like very kind of matter of fact belief like the, in like mystical things like trolls and yeah i was gonna i was just about, I was just about to, yeah yeah i was just about to say about the uh the story we heard about the like if they're building a road mm -hmm. and there's a massive boulder in the way they need to make sure it's not an elf rock yeah otherwise they'll just so sometimes they will actually it, divert it. <laughs> yeah. Really so. it, yeah. which i think is so <laughs> yeah of course and i love that they like yeah and then we have to get like a a communicator to come and like talk to them like do you think you can move on from this space because we're like gonna build a road whereas like in other places they just like build a like a motorway or whatever like straight through a town it's like sorry you're gonna bulldoze this town down yeah very different. yeah exactly i mean without getting too political it's like what they did over here in the uk with the high-speed rail they've just gone mm -hmm. yeah we'll go through there yeah. compulsory buy that's that yeah um yeah so it's nice that they they actually consult other other realms i as think well. one I thing that i always remember is and we, it, we i think we stopped filming haven't we at this point was when the northern lights turned on as it were and mm. it, it's hard mm -hmm. to if you've never seen them for like with your own eyes it's hard to explain isn't it because it's although pictures look great and videos look great until you actually see it slowly appear and then it's just woomph. yeah like it was quite a it's quite a cool moment it was wild yeah it was yeah and even like as you're watching it your brain couldn't quite like compute with what you were seeing kind of like <laughs> wait what it was like mm. But I think it was just the fact that yeah. it felt like a performance. Like it wasn't a static thing. It's like literally a show, mm. like a light show. Like you can sort of, and just like, you didn't like know where it was. Like it was in the clouds. It was like further than the clouds. Like the distance where it was from you felt really hard to understand if it was like right there or if it was like deep within space. It was yeah. kind of interesting. Yeah, like I, always, I always thought for some reason it would just, it, it would just cover as far as you could see in the sky mm -hmm. not just like as you say it almost like is it around the cloud area is it what mm -hmm. and it almost came over i don't want to put my hand over, hand over there you can't see in the camera <clears throat> but it almost just like came over like a cloud would I yeah it was weird yeah and it was a little bit area. cloudy wasn't it so like i'm sure like the visibility mm. even what we saw was like a little bit kind of obscured from how maybe you could see it on a complete sky but i was like so surprised that i'd like that we saw it because it was like right at the beginning of the season yep. in which you can see it. So I was like, we just, well, we knew good luck charms. We knew just, it was good because just, all the locals were asking us the next morning. Very excited. Did you see it? How, yeah. and they weren't, yeah, they were impressed it? by it. So it was, <laughs> yeah, if they're excited. Yeah. We're like, and then you hear people that go it. on trips there and they, they never saw it and they went there purposely to see it. It's like, yep. Sorry. Yeah, many times. Yeah, it's like, well, we went once and we like saw it by accident. We didn't even go looking for it. it came to us. I remember we were watching. It. I remember looking at the one camera guy and being like, "Should you be recording this?" And he's like, "Oh, oh." <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, <laughs> to get yeah. the camera. <laughs> yeah, I think they managed to get a bit. <laughs> yeah, so last year wasn't the only time uh, in Iceland when we filmed together. We mm -hmm. came together for the Harry Potter reunion filming extravaganza we did but it, <laughs> so quite... it's cool. it seemed to be a lot but I, I i completely forgot just how big a thing it is yeah when you haven't sense. been on a film set of that scale and then you go back you're like oh my gosh this was like it was like this like all the time i found it like overwhelming like i needed like a couple of days to like decompress afterwards like it was quite like a lot i mean i think also the energy was even higher than like you know particularly high just because the anticipation seeing anyone everyone and it, it all kind of came together so fast so it was quite like what are we doing and it, so it was all very like high of emotions but also yeah like the scale of just like all those cameras and crew and you're like how did we get like going back to the normal how was the how did that become normal for us and then we go back now and it's like so not normal yeah it can it was it, yeah I could only imagine because we don't do school reunions, especially in the UK. Mm -hmm. it, it's only what I could imagine that. Well, that that is the only kind of thing we would ever have for that. And I was amazed by how I could remember things literally like that from twenty years ago, which I've not I've not thought of in those twenty years. But there was something really cool about us all just hanging out in the Great Hall again. Mm -hmm. And I can remember us like hanging out at that table, and I can remember saying like. 
I never thought I would be back in here filming again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and in one, I always found that like in one moment, it felt like we'd, we, it'd been a long time since we'd filmed in there. But then at the next second, you could almost think that we'd only been there, say, a week before filming. It was weird, yeah, in time. The, just... On the set, it was ever so strange. Yeah. In the Great Hall, I mean, in Weasley's house, it was a bit different because you had like a Snapchat filter sign. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> at the outside. side of this 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 barrier in front of the table yeah, the but barrier it was, was, it was great there. to be able to do that but i feel like it's yeah. interesting how like environments and spaces and places like when you've actually spent a lot of time there similar to like maybe like the home you grew up in or whatever you can be there and like memories and different things come up and you lose kind of sense of time like the familiarity of that was like felt really even though there was something very different about it because they'd like dressed a little, you know, everything was just like a little different. Mm -hmm. But like at the core, it was just like, oh, we're just like back here in this familiar place that like hasn't changed. And and like what other film set like stays up, like however many years later, like still exists. It hasn't, they didn't have to like rebuild like a half fake version of it. It was like literally the same one in the same place. So that was strange. Mm. Mm. But I remember actually the good thing about it being fi when they were filming it though in the studio tour now is I know they were filming one segment and they, they asked everyone, a few people were looking around just seeing what was going on mm -hmm. and uh, cause remember we were, we were, everyone was asked to, to move along and so we went to the Quidditch bit where you could ride the broomsticks <laughs> and then literally just walking past just pressing these buttons what set all these animatronic things off. I know it's weird how it's like, yeah, a museum, like an interactive, like some parts are more interactive than they were when we were filming them. Like, no, that doesn't move. That really Yeah, just move. a bit. But yeah, it's kind yeah, of cool that so bit. many people got to like, just felt, I think what was so fun about that, I mean, it was felt like in a selfish way, it felt like a lovely thing just for us to experience and be together and film. But then it just felt like watching it and how they sort of like the angle and direction they went with it just felt very like, for fans which i think was so good and special just that kind of reminder of you know people lining up to get the books and and each film and just that kind of like hysteria and excitement of like all the footage they showed like outside of the filming we did you know just like stock like archive footage of things um felt just really lovely and exciting and everyone i've spoken to who like loves harry potter and has watched it just enjoyed it so much it just felt like a really like a nice like soothing reminder of of like the impact it's had on people's lives um mm. but yeah just yeah it felt like just a really like nice warm felt honestly too like oh like are we is it uh, too early to have a reunion are we like <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's a bit enough time. i mean cause I, was, but I'm, I mean as you say it's funny talking about the stock footage like there was a part so i didn't even i've never seen some of that bit before so there was a part on the they were telling a story about something that happened on the fourth film. Mm -hmm. And we were, there's a part where James and I are in the Great Hall. And there's a part where we're like jumping up and down and like shaking about and stuff. And I totally forgot that that's what Mike would ask us to do before they started filming. Oh, yeah, filming. yeah. He would be like, you, I, you all look funny. like, you all look so still and like bored. And he'd be like, jump up and down. Like, come on. Like, yeah. especially in the film that was obviously just like so much kind of, you know, excitement and. You know, the film that he did, that kind of like this, the tournament mm. and the thing is like, come on, like you're having the best time of your life. And like, it was cool that he had that kind of energy. I think we probably needed it coming on. We're all like yeah, becoming yeah. teenagers, yeah. like a bit slow. He's like, come on. <laughs> Shake out this of it. Was that, yeah. so I mean, was it, was it uh, for you, like us, so you hadn't seen it until it was released on New Year's Day? Yeah, I hadn't seen it. Or did you get a sneak peek? No, I didn't. So who did you watch it with? I watched it with my family. Because I was with, yeah, I was with my family for New Year's Eve. Well, we didn't, I guess we would have watched it like New Year's Day, yeah. Uh, and it was yeah. nice watching it with them because, you know, they were such a part of like, you know, same with you. Like our families were so a part of that whole experience. And they kind of went through similar kind of emotions alongside us, like kind of being a part, part of that and like watching us grow up through that so it was really nice to watch it with them I found it quite I almost want to watch it for a second time because it felt a bit like when you watched the films for the first time and all you could think of was like the experience of filming or you sort of like dissect it in a way that you're not like seeing it as like a full smooth story you're kind of like it's quite a roller coaster watching it so I feel like maybe I could because I didn't know, I literally didn't know how they were going to put it together. 
I was like, what is it? I have yeah. no well, idea. Well, we, did, we didn't, did we? We were, you did, no. Yeah, so I was like... That uh, night when we were all... Well, I was going to say, I think one of the most memorable moments from the reunion, yeah, one of the most memorable moments that I had uh, from the reunion was after we wrapped filming. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was eight of us. There was well, Dan, Emma, Matt, Tom, Evie, yourself, James mm -hmm. and myself. And we went for a private meal at the hotel mm -hmm. down the road from the studios. Um, so I shout out to Emma for sorting that one yeah. out. Um, and without divulging any of the stories or what we talked about mm -hmm. in that in that space, um, for those however many hours it was we were there, it was just great talking about things that happened away from filming and like yeah. reminiscing about some of the amazing guys who worked on the crew during the films and it was funny because it's one of the unique times when there's only the people in that room truly understand what it was like mm -hmm. to be part of those films and and to be able to speak freely about what happened without worried that a tiny soundbite would be made into the story and blown out of all proportion yeah and it was just cool just I suppose just like people do when they have a reunion with their mates down the pub. You talk about stuff that went on years gone by. Um, but I think that it was just, it was a, a unique thing. So there was things I learned that evening mm -hmm. that I was never aware of when we were filming. Mm -hmm. But that was, that just stuck out in my mind. As great as everything was, what we got on the show, what they filmed in the day in the studios, just that, that, that space of the meal I thought was pretty, pretty special. Yeah. And I think too, when you share those stories with people who you don't like have to you don't have to like explain it because it's just a shared like experience that you all knew you had. It's very hard to describe to people, you know, and people ask you what it was like or, you know, how was it? And it do it did just, it just was what it was. Like sometimes you suddenly, like, it just like was this and I don't really know how to explain it because like, I don't really know anything else like that. You know, that, that was the life we had. We each all have like individual lives. Obviously ours was quite unusual. So like, it's nice when you don't have to like, yeah, explain it to people because there's that kind of just quiet understanding. And therefore, like you say, then it's this kind of nice safe space to just like share experiences and I think what's been so nice about like the years that have gone by since we finished is it's been like a really nice time I think for everyone to just like individually reflect on like what it all was and like what was that filming what did we learn as individuals from that like what did we take away from it how do we apply it to our like lives now how is it still a part of us because I think when we were in the filming it just was happening and you just like were present to it which I think was great um, but for me, it's just been really interesting. Yeah, afterwards, just kind of like having a like a new relationship to it that feels like mm. kind of good and reflective and and just I think like I've made it more important on reflection. I think when I was filming, like I think you kind of like yeah, going back to the normal question too. You just wanted to be a kid, you know, when you went back to school on days you just wanted to be just a kid at school and you didn't want to like I wasn't going to go into a classroom and be like oh my god yesterday was amazing I filmed this thing with so and so and it was <laughs> yeah. so good I'd be like if someone's like oh how's filming going I'd be really like yeah it's good it's fine you know I'd, I'd like play it down almost because I wanted to just be you know normal or or like not judged because I was someone who was like boasting or something but I think mm, upon finishing mm. the filming, I'm like, oh, actually that was amazing. And maybe I didn't like in internally boast about it enough in my mind as a kind of celebration of it, not like a, yeah, I don't know how to explain it, but I think it's been nice to just be like, that was amazing. And we all like really committed to that 10 years. And that was like a big thing and, and like a big experience mm. that's like, don't want to like shake or forget kind of thing. No, definitely. I, what what amazed me, and I, I, I was, I think like you said earlier, I was. It took me a couple of days to decompress mm -hmm. from what we were doing, like yeah. what happened, because it was so many emotions came running back, and so many thinking about things, and I was thinking about how I, I was confused, how I was feeling about being confused, how I was feeling. Yeah, yeah, very yeah. <laughs> if you're with me on that yeah. one, um, so but I was. It also made me laugh how like individual private jokes were still there like mm -hmm. 10 years later or something like that and I think that that little bit where we were just hanging out in the the Weasley Borough for the first time in I don't know how long with Mark and that was that was cool just our own little den yeah it um, was nice to like break for away it and so. do that moment 
and definitely and how nice that was often when we had those like quieter scenes in the weasley house they were just a bit calmer a bit more like focused like you felt like more in the thick of it obviously when you had these huge huge scenes in the great hall like obviously it was slightly diluted because there's just so many people so it was nice like just to have those see that scene in the weasley in the burrows and just remember like oh yeah we had like good fun in this on this set and mm, it was always mm. like i always found it was a place to just like be a bit more like carefree in a way because just we were like even more comfortable and it was just a bit of a safer like space and often there were more like specific scenes that our characters were like doing in that uh set i think it's, i'm still i'm still now i'm thinking about it even more i think it's just amazing that we like for example there's certain stories and tales that everybody could tell but there's like an un unspoken word that we won't share those stories <laughs> yeah which people when i when i heard you were doing a book i was like what are you doing bon yeah <laughs> <laughs> especially after sitting in that room for like a couple of hours over dinner we were like oh no cats out of the back <laughs> yeah it's, uh, no it was, it was what i think that again there is that, that thing where it's everyone knows that there is this safe space mm -hmm. that it's not going to go get people aren't going to say oh did you know this this and this happened just general gossip column type thing um that there is that nice and yet no one ever said that to us, did they? Don't do this, don't do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. There wasn't, there was like a very protective mentality of the product, the producers kind of thing, just like naturally, but it wasn't like there were rules that we needed to be a certain way. I think it was more like they treated us as children and young adults as adults. So like we then felt like we had the responsibility, so we didn't want to like ruin that responsibility we had. So it like made us... Like we were never patronized and i think that made us be mm. like responsible and like um level-headed because we were given the freedom to like do that for ourselves we weren't like told to behave and be you know quiet mm. or mm. um too safe about things like it felt like we had like boundaries but like also it was a playground kind of thing yeah yeah i mean did you notice though say where for, for argument's sake when you went when you went back to school that you would speak to teachers like you would do, say, members of the crew at the studios. Mm -hmm. But the te I, in my experience anyway, the teacher would look at me like, why are you talking to me like that? Yeah, like, like to... Your student, <laughs> yeah. me adult. Yeah. And it was this weird dynamic, and I don't think they quite knew how to handle that. Like a student just saying, you're right, sir. And yeah, just being, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, it was this weird thing. Did you get, ever get anything like that? Or, or your teacher's a bit more, hello, Bonnie, nice to see you. Yeah, I don't know. I guess my school that I went to was quite small, like everyone you talk, called your teachers by their first name, not like Mr. or Mrs. or whatever. So I okay. feel like there was already a little bit of a kind of relaxedness of like the dynamic between student and teacher. But I think also you had this like, cause you had to like go to each teacher and like get the schoolwork for every term of work every year. There was like already this kind of intimacy there that they were kind of like some teachers didn't mind it at all. And they were like quick to just like, yeah, okay, let's sit down, let's get this work. And mm. then others were kind of like a bit thrown by by that, just cause it's like, I'm the teacher, I'm just gonna do it in the class, but now I've got to like give it to you. I don't know, it was an interesting um, experience and you have to be like really, I think naturally, like you say, we'd got confidence speaking to sort of like having a working relationship with adults at a young age. So I think that kind of confidence helped me to be okay and confident to chat to my teachers a lot more than maybe another student would to get that work like I think it probably helped um mm. but I remember at times it would be I think obviously you develop at such different rates during those like really formative like teen years so I felt like sometimes I'd go back to school and I felt like a bit behind on growing up they were all I don't know there was suddenly like socially just a bit more chatting and going out and doing things and then other times I'd come back to school and I'd feel really ahead and like people would feel a bit behind of me in the year so it was kind of an interesting like pull and push at like how in line I felt with my like classmates kind of thing um mm. yeah because they're just such Did... big years that you go through like huge feelings and shifts and changes did you find that that like you're talking about your your confidence and everything growing we're doing everything that we're going through when we're at the studios do you think that's helped you in getting more confident in doing like your sustainability mm -hmm. 
way of living and and all that kind of thing and like the confidence to do it but not just to do it but to share it with the world and hopefully get more people doing it as well yeah I think naturally like you know I guess sharing it is like a form of sort of storytelling and I guess for me that's like all I really know how to do is like tell stories from first an acting perspective and then when I went to university I studied directing and writing so I've always like only known like communication essentially as my like method to like understand the world and like interact with it so I think for me yeah sharing feels I guess a little easy for me and easier for me but I do think interestingly like the the idea for this book like everything that's in the book at was just these things that I was doing at home through my own curiosity of trying trying different things, shifting my habits, trying to make things at home kind of from scratch rather than buying stuff. And they were all just like intimate things I was like quite happy to just be quietly doing at home. Like they weren't for the purpose of sharing or like telling everyone. It was just an internal thing. And then mm. slowly after the years of doing it, I was like, oh, actually this is kind of almost a really interesting part, not just the kind of global actions I was taking with Greenpeace or going to a climate rally, these more like front facing, more like traditional kind of, you know, speaking at the microphone, like these were the opposite. These were like the more internal quiet mm. stuff. And I was like, oh, actually this is really interesting. And this actually needs to be shared when I didn't really think it needed to be. Um, and mm. that there was maybe more like humanism within that because it was just like me attempting, trying, not always getting things right. You, you know, it was just this kind of place at home that I felt like wasn't being seen. So it was interesting when I suddenly was realized, oh, actually, this is kind of the most interesting thing to share. So um, and getting a confidence to do that, like took a minute for sure, because I like, you know, there's doubt comes in like as any human does, like who wants to hear this or can I even communicate this? How shall I communicate this? Yeah, yeah, I mean, cause I remember when I remember noticing it. I think we must have been at one of the Universal openings or something mm -hmm. like that. We were definitely on a on a promo trip, and I remember you had this huge water bottle with you, <laughs> and you hadn't mentioned it or anything like that. And I said, I said, Bon, what's up with the water bottle? And you just <laughs> very simply said, Well, I don't like having what's the point? I've, you know, it was along the lines of what's the point in a non recycling in not having you know fast plastics or whatever the term you use. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the exact word analogy, but it broke it down very simply as I can refill this and I'm not damaging anything else by contributing more mm -hmm. plastic waste. And I think you so said, simple. did you say that Oliver, as you were carrying like five plastic bottles of water, <laughs> just why have you got all that chucking them on the floor? Yeah. I don't need this. I don't care. I was setting them on fire as well. You know, <laughs> just like, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't for those watching. Um, sarcasm, but yeah, it was, that, um, yeah, I'm going to get, I'm going to lynch now. No, it's, um, but just just looking at simple things like that, that even from a someone who, even though you weren't saying it to anyone at the time, mm -hmm. it was quite easy to see that you were doing that yeah. already. So it's great that you're able to now put that in more of a, as you say, for for front and center mm -hmm. for a lot of people to notice who may be curious of it or even doing it already, but may think, oh, some different ideas. You know, mm -hmm. there's there's a difference between maybe just chucking a a bottle or or whatever in the plastic recycling bin, but what happens to it after that? Like you hear stories yeah. about it just being dumped on a beach in Turkey or something, mm -hmm. as opposed to how can you cut waste down yourself? No, it does. It does. James, I know you laughed, but a couple of months ago there was this big scandal. <laughs> no, but I'm just imagining you just like putting it in the bin, then some random person just appears <laughs> and then it. takes it on a plane to Turkey and just yep. But <laughs> no, yeah, they I did. No, they did. Not honestly. <laughs> yeah, okay, that, we're going off track here. <laughs> but yeah, I think with the yeah, like you're saying, like how you notice me have that water bottle, like you know, big thing with. Um, different ways we can like inspire action. Obviously we do need sometimes people to give these like crazy inspiring speeches or in front of huge mm. crowds as there has been in movements gone by, but there's also nothing as powerful sometimes as just like noticing someone that you know, or even in the street doing something that like uh, displays some type of like action or kind of behavior that is like a model behavior or something that you're like, oh, I, I like that idea and they're not like shouting at you across mm. the street like why haven't you got your reusable water bottle kind of thing they're just like carrying yeah. it and smiling and like, oh this is you know this is what I do and, and not sharing that information but not like in a judgmental way I think is so important because for me if someone starts 
shaming me that I'm not doing something. I'm like, I get more angry and I don't want to do it. That's not usually like that beneficial. So I think it's just like how it's communicated. And also like, there is literally no way we can be like perfectly sustainable environmental humans when so many systems are like so broken, it makes it impossible for us to be like perfect or whatever that is. So the book is really about like this idea that like there is no right or wrong, good or bad, like, and we can't be perfect. And actually it distracts us from giving a, having a go and being imperfect in doing it. I think so many people can be, you know, I've been so surprised at how many people have been like so scared that they'd do something but get it wrong or they feel intimidated by, you know, certain kind of communities of people or certain types of shops to walk into. So I think it's like that is the big part, like unless that like is broken down and people feel like safe and accepted to just give it a go, like it's going to stop loads of people from just like trying in their own way. And like, even if it's just like one thing mm. you implement and also it can change like one week you remember something and then the next week life happens and those things disappear for a bit, but then they come back. Like it's also okay that like our lives change and habits we implement can't necessarily be like every day forever. It's just like not human. Mm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. 100%. Very good. So, so Bon, one more time, I just want to get this out there to make so many people know about it. So it's binding day today. Yeah, I think it's getting banned goes, today. And I can't believe you're not there anyway. So we should, we should, we should, we should make like a little, a little presentation now. Um, but so it goes from binding day right now. Mm-hmm. When's it out? And what's the easiest way for people to get hold of it? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, I have a website that has all the kind of different retailer links on it. Um, it's available in the US, UK, Australia and New Zealand. My website is gogently.earth and it has all the links on there. Um, in the next couple of weeks as well, I'm going to be doing two different like, um, I guess like pre-order incentives. Uh, and we're still figuring out, but I think one is going to be like a sneak peek, like downloadable PDF. And the other is a discount on this other like product I'm making around it. So look out for some pre-order incentives if you want a little extra treat. And even if you have bought it already, you still get the incentive. Um, and yeah, it comes out on the 19th of April. It'll be physical book and an audio book. Uh, I probably will be doing a couple events around it. I think I'm going to be doing one in LA and one in London. Um, and... Yeah, and you can watch the YouTube too, which is just go gently on YouTube. Uh, again, there's a link. To, all the links are kind of on that website, go gently earth. Okay, great. And we will add it in the info bar to the show as well. Thank you. I don't know why I said it like that. Yeah, we will do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Bonnie, as as Oliver said at the start, this is now normal, not normal. That's what it's called. So mm-hmm. I know we pretty much glanced on it, but couple of questions what does the word normal mean to you i feel like sometimes it can change like sometimes normal can feel like boring if that makes sense like normal can sometimes be like something stripped back of like and be quite like neutral i guess like that kind of and then other times to me normal can just feel like acceptance and um just like like that position of like home, if that makes sense, that like kind of just place that you know, like you're just yourself and it's like a home thing. So I think when I think Mm. that normal is boring, I feel like that's my like judgmental like brain coming in, maybe like from, like I was saying before, how I wanna be like more normal, but I've realized now that like actually we can just celebrate who we are and that is normal, if that makes sense. Just talking about like how when I was younger and going to school and wanting to be like as normal as possible. Um, but I think now I think of normal more being just like exactly who you are with no sense of like who you're going to be judged by or like even judged by yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cool. And so what, <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to ask, ask this next one. So if, what is the most normal thing about you then? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> What is the most normal thing about me? If normal's you being you, what's the most normal thing (laughs) about being you? I feel like just like things that we all do every day, right? Just like I wake up, make coffee in the exact same way every morning, have like variation of like three different 
things for breakfast, maybe the same thing on weeks on end. There's like those like habits and rituals in your day that just feel so normal, like walking my dog, like just those human things, I guess, that just like you like to hold on to because they feel like nice and normal, especially when things can change for us from week to week, month to month. Like one minute you can be like super mm. busy doing another thing and then another thing, another week you like way quieter. So those things that I keep the same, no matter what or how busy I am, make me feel okay. kind of normal. Similar to like what we're talking to about like the certain things I like travel with to sort of be a little less, like make less kind of waste and be a bit more resourceful. Those feel like, kind of similar things to making my coffee in the same way every morning. Like if I'm traveling and I have those few things and materials I like, that feels like a version of a kind of, yeah, kind of routine, I guess. But right. that doesn't, so what would you I don't say? know if that really explains what? what's the most normal thing about me, but <laughs> I'm just human well, and I wake well, I up and I go to sleep and <laughs> think about food and that's about it. <laughs> So what was it? What, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a bit of an easier one then. What would you say is the least normal thing about you? Um, or maybe not so easy. Normal thing. That's hard because I'm like, I might say that and people are like that's pretty normal. It's not that interesting. Uh, what is the least? I know it's not normal. Okay. You've just written a book, an audio book. <laughs> yeah. Not many people have done that. It's true. And I'm even like still luckily like present enough to realize that that is quite wild. So I still even can't quite believe that I've done it too. So that is, feels good. And that's yeah, why I'm so excited achieved. to feel and hold the first book. Cause I'm like, oh wow. Yeah, I bet. It's real. I'm excited to, excited to read it as well. Yeah. Actually, very, very good fun. So I know we, so I always end up with with five questions, and I know I've asked you these before. But <laughs> if you want to give new answers, you're more than welcome. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> quick, quick fire. What is your favourite book? I know, I know. <laughs> uh, it's called Go Gently. Uh, it's really Go Gently, good. It's my yeah. favourite book on <laughs> earth. Uh, ooh, what's my favourite book? I mean, we can like say that book. one if you want. We can we can we can keep it go gently, but okay, fine. Yeah, my my new favorite book yeah. is Go Gently. Yeah. <laughs> what is your favorite food? Oh, chocolate. If that's a whole food, <laughs> or bread. <laughs> <laughs> See how out. normal I am. Uh, <laughs> I just like my favorite food is bread. <laughs> <laughs> what well, um? What is your favorite film? Oh, uh, my favorite film is Children of Men by Alfonso Cuaron, who directed the uh, Prisoner of Azkaban. Yeah. yeah. Your favorite song? Uh, Into the Mystic by Van Morrison. And your favorite quote? Uh, yeah, it says, um, well, I have two. Can I share it? Go on. Okay, that's there's right. one that's on that's a post-it right. note right on my computer that says, I don't actually know who said it. A few people have said it and kind of changed it. But there is no wrong way to do the right thing. And then another quote is uh, about like, it's by uh, Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson. And it is, uh, the health of the eye seems to demand a horizon. We are never tired so long as we can see far enough. And I love horizons, like, so I love the beach and open spaces. I like to see, like, far beyond and feel like there's other things out there. Hmm. Mm. Oh, fantastic. Very good. That's awesome. Well, Bun, to, uh, to lack of, I was kind of trying to think of a, a more poetic way to finish this off then, but I just want to say <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today, again on here, and telling us all about, obviously, Go Gently and the exciting stuff coming up with that, reminiscing about some of the other stuff we've been going on too. And thank you for joining us on your book binding day. Uh, thank you. Yes. I'm here <laughs> talking to you instead of seeing it bound, you know. Um, yeah. But it's well, been we'll, we'll do what we'll do in the edit. We'll just, we'll add some sound of like just some machinery post, in the yeah. background. We'll make it out like you're actually there hot off the press i'm just like quickly come to chat I like, want to go glue <laughs> yeah. some things back there <laughs> yeah <laughs> we're well, fun thanks but so thank much thank you thanks it's been so lovely Cheers. and yeah see you soon
Now, it is always a pleasure to be able to see Bon. And I feel like every time we chat, I feel even more inspired to live in a more eco-friendly way. Uh, so, guys, make sure you go and pre-order her book now at gogently.earth slash book. I know I will be doing the same as well. Uh, it's just been, yeah, it's great listening to all that stuff because... As we, as we said in the show, like we were able to speak to Bond and obviously I see subtle things that she does. But yeah, now it's all actually written down in that format has been is a great resource to be able to go to. And obviously the YouTube channel as well. Definitely. I, I know we, we talked about it briefly in there, but I remember when she was saying she was starting to write a book. And mm. it's so cool to see that process. Like we saw it with Ivana as well. Ivana, um, her book is absolutely fantastic as well, by the way. It's very... She leaves like Evie leaves nothing off the table, so it was uh, that that's really cool to check out as well. Um, so seeing Bonnie do the same, but in a different way, and about just basically how doing things that she does, and we've seen how literally her sustainable living in a lot of the things that she does, she just na- like it's not it's she, she's not saying this to appear to do this, like she genuinely does this, and I know whenever we're with her, we always doubly make sure that we're carrying our own water bottles that do you know what I mean like that kind of stuff because you don't want them you don't want to let the sister down no but the other thing as well is that I would say with Bon is that she doesn't shame you if you're doing something what maybe isn't do you know what I mean she necessarily doesn't necessarily agree with or something like that I think that's a a great trait to have that there unfortunately there are people who because you're not doing something the way they do it people just suddenly want to shame you and say no no no, no, no like bark at you and just like without actually saying to you this is why you shouldn't do that or this is what would be a better alternative to do that actually have dialogue whereas as i say you get some people you could even you can even do a simple thing of asking someone a question about something especially on social media this is i'm talking about and you just get absolutely bombasted with just nonsense just literally like hate speech it's like a t- it's like from um what was it you know the orwell novel 1984 the two minute hate just like, ah, 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 like people just screaming at you for no reason but the good thing about bon is that obviously she's an activist but she's not that aggressive and it's just quite easy to actually learn things from her uh which is an amazing thing to uh, to be able to still have as an amazing characteristic very much so so everybody we really do hope you enjoyed that one and bonnie thank you so much for joining us and we really do hope that the book goes well like oliver said if you want a copy and i definitely recommend you do you go to www.gogently.earth slash book and get yours today now as this is the final episode of the season i've got my final did you knows of the season Ooh, so go on then i've got a couple well i've got four okay so bear with me number one did you know? <laughs> Obviously, a lot of people go to Google for any questions that they ever have, right? Mm-hmm. So Google is actually the world's most visited website. Mm-hmm. One of the top things searched for at Google, I think it's number seven, is Google. Figure that one out. You're already on Google. What? Why are you Googling? Yep. But did you know? You're going to get right, Oliver, go on to Google right now. Okay. On Google. Google. The actual website. Yeah, I'm on Google. Okay, and type in the search bar, yep. do a barrel roll. A song by Betty Harves. Better Harves. No. No, you have to no. type, do a do barrel a... roll. Yeah. Yeah. And it should spin around. No. Do a barrel roll. Do I search that? Yes. Oh, wow. So for those... Oh, fuck, bloody hell, that was hard, wasn't it? Basically, Make guys, Google do a barrel roll and six other crazy Easter eggs. Huh. See, they put, they know, put Easter a, eggs on their website. There you go. I've got a did you know for you. Go on. Did you know in Birmingham, in England, there is actually a slang term for a forward roll? Not used anywhere else in the country, dare I say the world. I remember saying this once to somebody from down in London. They looked at me like I've gone mad. The term for a forward roll in Birmingham and the West Midlands, I suppose, as a whole, is gamble. Work that out, where someone has come up with a reason to make a slang term for a forward roll, because you do it every day. Thank you for that one. There you go, sorry. Did you know the first and only band to play all seven continents is Metallica? Metallica, correct. There we are. Yes. 
Yes. Now, doing these podcasts, we've had a lot of fun and it's been great to to learn about um, encouragement and people have, have shared with us their experiences and their joy and their, their kind of sense of, of happiness with the podcast and just listening to it. And so did you know, according to a study that was done, a genuine natural the a genuine natural of encouragement is a character strength that you benefit from just as much as the person being encouraged. So by encouraging, people will like you more and they'll also like themselves more. So it literally does create a great circle that represents good life. So if you ever think about encouraging someone in any small way, that honestly could make their day and it will probably make you feel good that you've encouraged them too. Hmm. Here, and that's sci- that's just science. <laughs> so it's a, it's a fact. And finally, my final did you know of the season? And this is a good one, okay? Yep. Instead of saying cheese when you have a photo, so we go cheese, right? Yeah. Say cheeks, as in those things on the side of your face, and it will make your j- smile seem a lot more genuine. Cheese cheeks oh, okay see tell you a funny one to tell to I, remember, I used to do this right all the time you know if you're on a night out or whatever like that and there's a group of there's a group of girls and they're like oh can you take a photo of us please so it's like okay so you take their phone I'd always say okay one two three say prune and next thing they're all pouting prune oh. I also learned that the yeah. I also learned if you say whiskey that makes you smile a lot yeah with a couple of reasons but anyway cheeks jolly good cheeks, jolly good. cheeks. There we go. Really? That was my final <laughs> did you knows for the season. And, oh, and I guess another random one. Did you know? Everybody, you are all awesome. On behalf of Oliver and um, myself, I'm going to speak for you on this point. <laughs> Thank right, you so okay. much to everybody for all your input, your listening, and just making this silly little thing that we've been doing um your weekly listen so thank you so much whether you are driving to work whether you're running whether you're just hanging out with family whatever you're doing thank you so much for letting us be a part of your lives for a a certain time of a week it really honestly means more to us than you probably realize i also want to say a big thanks to alice to kate to dave and all the editing team behind the scenes as well um we've had a great time so thank you so much everybody for making normal not normal normal you're normal. Yes, I completely concur and replicate what my brother has just said there. So, guys, for the final time. I've been Oliver Phelps. I still hate the drum. And I've been James Phelps. Uh, we're going to take a little bit of a break now, but you'll still be able to follow all of our adventures on social media. So make sure you can... Check us out on Instagram or Twitter. And if you like this, like and subscribe. So I finally said it. Good, good. <laughs> like guys, and subscribe. Until next time. Definitely. Until next time, guys. I've been James. He's been Oliver. Cheerio.